On behalf of Bells Corners United Church, I welcome and greet you to our worship service in the name of Jesus Christ on the seventh Sunday after Epiphany. We are so glad that you have joined us today. We have reopened the sanctuary for in-person worship service at 10 in the morning. If you wish to attend the service, you are more than welcome. As a faith community called to love and to serve others, we highly recommend getting fully vaccinated as one of the best precautionary measures to protect yourself and others. Let us continue to be mindful of the health protocols such as masking and social distancing, hand sanitizing, and staying home if you feel unwell. Please take note too that our Sunday worship service continues to be offered via YouTube, by email, and by telephone. A friendly reminder to please take time to keep in touch with each other through prayers, phone calls, emails, or via Zoom. Check also the many announcements on our website, including Sunday School resources for your children at bcuc.org, or to keep yourself informed and give you opportunities to respond. Our general uh, annual general meeting will take place by Zoom on Sunday, March the 6th at 11.15 in the morning. The purpose of this meeting is to review and receive the 2021 annual report and audited financial statements 
and to approve the 2022 Annual Activity Plan, Budget and Nominations Report, and various other items of importance. To ensure the congregation is informed and ready to discuss and that new business items are given an adequate amount of time for deliberation, members are encouraged to notify the board of their intent to introduce any new items of business or new motions on topics outside of annual plans, budgets, nominations, and items arising from the minutes of the previous meeting by emailing Jordan Berard before noon, Friday, February the 25th. A mover and a seconder for motions, as well as any background material, can be distributed to the congregation at least one week prior to the meeting. Friends, I now invite you to center yourself in God's presence as we gather in worship. We light this Christ candle, the light that shines in the shadows of life, the light that bursts like sunshine through clouds of sadness, the light that changes gloom into gladness. We light this Christ candle, rejoicing that the presence of God is with us. Please join me in the call to gather. Friends, we gather once more at the feet of wisdom. We come to learn. We desire to be changed. These are not easy teachings, for they would have us go beyond familiar horizons of belief and action. We come to be challenged. We desire to grow. Come then, let us journey on this road together, open to new insight and willingness to enter God's vision for a renewed and just world. We have come together. We desire to uplift others. Come, let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. Life-giving God, whose love knows no limits and whose embrace extends to all, stir within us a deepening thirst for the teachings of Jesus. Make us aware that being in right relationship pushes us to respect and honor others without expecting much in return. Bend our hearts to your teaching and not selfish gain. Renew us to your promise of love when we move away from your healing presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
In our Bible reading this morning, Jesus says something to his followers that I'm sure you've all heard before. He says to them, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You've heard that before, haven't you? We've heard it in lots of different ways, really, and we call that the golden rule. Well, today I have a book to read to you that's called that too. It's called The Golden Rule. It's written by Eileen Cooper, and it's illustrated by Gabby Sviatskowska. The Golden Rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A boy and his grandfather stood on a city sidewalk, looking up at the words printed on a billboard. Grandpa, what does that say? He, the boy asked. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. People all over the world call those words the golden rule. What does it mean? The boy wanted to know. And why is it golden? It means this. Treat people the way you would like to be treated. It's golden because it's so valuable and a way of living your life that's so simple it shines. Grandfather led the boy to another billboard farther down the street. Some people put the golden rule another way. Do nothing to other people that you would not like having done to you. Either way, he said, it's a very good rule. Who's it for? The boy asked. You. Me, anyone can practice the golden rule. A rule that's the same for children and grown-ups? Same rule. There aren't too many rules like that. Very few. And it's for people everywhere? Everywhere. Whatever their religion, people find the idea of the golden rule in their holy books, Grandfather said. Christianity says you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. Judaism says what is hateful to you do not do to your fellow humans. Islam says hurt no one so that no one may hurt you. Hinduism says this is the sum of duty to do nothing to others which would cause them pain. Buddhism says do not do to others what would hurt you. The Shawnee tribe says, do not kill or injure your neighbor, for it is not he or she that you injure, you injure yourself. The boy and his grandfather sat on a park bench. So, Grandpa, how can I start to practice the golden rule? You begin by using your imagination. My imagination? You imagine how someone else feels. For instance, a new child who's joining your class. How do you think that boy or girl is feeling? Well, new kids always look scared. Would you be scared if it was you? Oh, yes. What would make you feel better? If if someone smiled at me. So, to practice the golden rule, you would smile at the new kid. You've got it. I bet you can think of other ways you'd like to be treated and ways you would not, wouldn't want to be treated. How do you feel when you're teased or bullied? Sad, yes. Mad, yes. Small, I feel small. Sad, mad, small. Do you like feeling like that? No, well, neither does anyone else. The boy thought for a moment about the golden rule. I see. There are lots of things I can do. I should tell the truth because I don't like being lied to. I want people to listen to me, so I should listen to other people. When I'm sick or I'm tired or sometimes I need help. So I should offer my help to those who need it. You're getting the idea, Grandfather nodded. The boy looked at his grandfather. Practicing the golden rule seems like it can be hard. I said it was simple. I didn't say it would always be easy. Grandpa, the boy said, the golden rule is a very big thing, isn't it? 
very big and very small and very old. It's been around for thousands of years. Thousands of years? Well, then I don't think everyone is practicing the way they should. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many problems between people, between countries. You're right, my boy. I wonder how things would change if everyone lived by the golden rule. Well, I think people would be nicer, kinder. They'd be act better toward their families and friends and even strangers. What if countries lived by the golden rule, Grandfather asked. Well, then people wouldn't want to hurt each other because they don't like being hurt. Maybe there wouldn't be any wars. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Wonderful, Grandpa. But you can't make everyone in the world practice the golden rule. There's only one person you can ask to do that. Me? You. It begins with you. I wonder if that story made you think about the golden rule a little differently. It seems like such an easy thing to do, and it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, that we would be nice to other people because we like them to treat us nicely, but that isn't always the way it works. Sometimes people aren't nice to us, no matter how nice we are to them. It takes a little bit of work, I think, to, to make the golden rule a good thing to do. What do you think? When is it hard to follow the golden rule? And should you follow it anyway? Hmm. Let's finish with a prayer. God of love, following the golden rule is easy with people we like. Help us to remember that it's even more important with people we have trouble getting along with. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Here we are, once again loving God, looking to locate Jesus in the pages of the Bible and then in the hours of our days. 
Your Spirit has shown us the honor and responsibility of being a follower. Now today and in the weeks ahead, reveal to us the nuances of living as a disciple day by day. Amen. The Gospel reading today is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Love your enemies. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be the children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Judging others. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. May the light of Christ dwell where the word is spoken. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Let your spirit of wisdom flow through us, O God, as we reflect on this difficult teaching of Jesus. Amen. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. I knew this verse since I was young. 
I tried my hardest to apply it in real life. But one thing I can say is this. These words from Jesus are more easily said than done. Something happened one night in 1995. I was working in a retail store as my part-time job to support my studies at St. Paul University. A drunk man came into the store and demanded me to sell one of the dresses. All he had was a few coins in his pocket, and I politely told him that his money was not enough to buy the dress. To which he responded in a loud voice, with his fingers pointing at me. You little Chinese girl, I must have this dress and will not leave the store. Then he lied down on the floor, waiting for my next move. Fear crept into my body, but I stood my ground and I told him that his behavior was not acceptable and asked him to please leave the store or else I called the police. As soon as he heard the word police, he became agitated and stood up in front of me and called me all kinds of offensive names. He was about six foot tall and a bulky man, and I know that if I had hurled back at him the way he treated me with offensive language and racial slurs, he might have hurt me, or worse, that could be the end of my life. I called the store manager in the back room to come right away. When the manager came, the drunk man was again lying on the floor and he said he would not get up until we gave him the dress that he wanted. So I called 911 and told the dispatcher about the incident. When the man heard that police officers were coming to the store, he got up, pointing his finger at me, and left the store. Love your enemies. Who are the enemies that Jesus talks about in this passage? I believe the enemies in this text relate to anyone that may cause another harm or injury or death in many forms. How could Jesus tell us not only to love them, but also to pray for them and bless them? I don't know about you, but this text doesn't make sense to me at all. It runs against the normal way of human relationships. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. If anyone takes away your coat, give them also your shirt. If anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. How could Jesus set forth a list of values that are so difficult, or even unrealistic to strive for. But I think that's exactly the point of this text. To live by Jesus' standards is to live above and beyond human standards. In reality, there are enough bad and opportunistic people running loose out there who would take Jesus' words literally and run down on people. These words encourage the bullies of the world to abuse, to hurt, or to put down others. They could be words of invitation to the non-stop ringing of the phone or knocking on your door from those wanting to ask for donations. These are words to justify being trampled and hated by those who do not know how to love. I am just overwhelmed beyond words that Jesus would suggest such things for good living. But is this really what the Luke and Jesus intends for us to hear? How can we love our enemies? How can we bless them and pray for them when they are causing us harm? Let us look at the three illustrations that Jesus offers in this particular text. And these illustrations, I think, are relevant in the context of the first century world. The first illustration, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, 
or for the other also. Well, in the ancient Jewish culture, it was an offensive gesture to be slapped with the back of the right hand. The back of the right hand was given by a master to a slave or by a husband to a wife or by a parent to a child or by a Roman to a Jew in that period. The only way one could hit someone on the right cheek would be the back of the hand. So what Jesus was trying to tell his listeners is this. When someone tries to humiliate you and put you down, turn your other cheek. If you turn your head to the right, that person could no longer backhand you because your nose is in the way. By turning the other cheek, you are defiantly saying to the assailant, I refuse to be humiliated by you any longer. And you have stood your ground courageously. The second illustration. If anyone takes away your coat, also give your shirt. In those days, if a person had a loan or a debt, normally they would use animals or land as collateral. But the poor could use their coat or outer garment. And it was the coat that they used to sleep at night and use as an overcoat by day. For the debtor to give both his coat and shirt means a cold, sleepless night, and worse, he could be totally naked. It is obvious that Jesus' audience is made up of very poor debtors. They are never going to win a case since the law is mostly on the side of the wealthy. So Jesus says to them, Okay, you're not going to win the case. So why not take the law into a point of absurdity? When your creditor sues you for your outer garment, give your undergarment as well. That meant taking off the only stitch of clothing you had left on you and standing literally naked in court. The shame of nakedness fell not on the person who was naked, but on the person who observed their nakedness. The creditor is being put in the position of being shamed by the nakedness of the debtor. Imagine the debtor leaving the courtroom, walking out in the street, and all of the people coming and seeing him in his nakedness and saying, what happened to you? And the debtor says, well, that creditor has got all my clothes and starts walking down his house with his head held high, the debtor certainly has won the case. The third and last illustration, give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Come on, folks, let's be realistic. If someone takes away all my goods without my permission, that for me is theft. And the person who took my goods is legally accountable by law. However, this text should be understood in the context from which they were drawn. And this illustration were directed at the rich and wealthy people in the crowd. Jesus was telling them, you do not need any explanation to understand this. It is simply saying that you share what you have. And do not demand back anything taken from you because you have more than enough. Let's admit it. Loving your enemies by turning the other cheek or gift wrapping your coat and shirt or giving unconditionally will not make us get ahead in this world. Jesus knows too well the rules of this world where most of the time Only the powerful and the fittest survive. Jesus isn't trying to change the rules of the world. Rather, he's starting a new movement by calling the rules of this world into question and offering an alternative, an entirely subversive or even a ridiculous way to relate to each other, inviting everyone into relationships governed not by power or violence or that 
any other things that would destroy the other but by the power to love. And this is not just an ordinary kind of love. This is agape love in action. A love that is unconditional, self-giving, non-violent, and life-giving. The power of this agape love was preached and lived by the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, who was remembered as a man of faith an advocate of social justice who suffered under the violent regime of apartheid. His commitment to follow Jesus, particularly loving one's enemies, can be found in some of his famous words. He said at one point, when we see others as the enemy, we risk becoming what we hate. He also said that a person is a person through other persons. You cannot be human in isolation. You are human only in relationships. Sadly, the effects of the old order are still prominent in the world. People still uh, settle disputes with fists and firearms. Wars are still out there. People still live in poverty and homelessness. Marginalization is still rampant. People still think with pride and seem intent on creating a world of division and discord. And some still practice the vengeful way of an eye for an eye. And some communities are hotbeds of fear and violence. What is the good news of this passage for us today? Jesus is not teaching us to be doormats. Rather, Jesus invites us to see and feel and apply that God's love is unconditional. Therefore, we must love unconditionally, no matter how difficult it takes for us to do this. Jesus is inviting us to stretch our boundaries, to raise our sights on creating a more compassionate world and to create among us a true community of respect based on self-giving. Agape love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend because it has creative and redemptive powers. It is easy for us to be kind to those who are nice to us and to love those who love us in return. But Jesus' challenge is to go further, to love the unlovable, to notice and pay attention to the invisible, to give the needy without expecting anything in return, to include those who are outside our circles. Jesus paved the way for a new order that does not simply make the weak strong, but one that will transform the nature of a community. What does it mean for you to be in this new community? Are you invited and are you able to love your enemies, to bless them and pray for them? Are you ready to apply agape love, not only to the community that you're in, but to also those people that were not included in your inner circle. Jesus has said so far, you are to love as God loves, wholly, completely, consistently, unconditionally. Difficult? Yes, but it's not impossible. Acting on such love is quite a challenge, but it can change you, it can change your community, it can change the world radically. That unforgettable night in 1995, I have never felt so afraid in my life. But instead of succumbing to my fears and 
hating that man who insulted me and offended me, I prayed. I prayed for that man that whatever circumstances he had lived through, may he find his true inner self, transform his life, and become a better person. I pray to myself that when things get rough and when people put me down or harm me, may I remind myself that resisting creatively and nonviolently is the way to peace. I prayed that God's agape love would continue to empower and strengthen me. And yes, I thank God that I was able to get home safe that night. Amen. I offer this prayer, some of which were parts of a prayer written by Rex Hunt and our moderator, the Right Reverend Richard Bott, for strength and for hope and for blessing these days. Let us gather our hearts in prayer. This moment of quiet is an invitation to be calm in the midst of the noise of the world and our over-busy lives, to bring together thought and feeling, mind and spirit, and to find some center, some still point of perspective and peace. Holy God, we come to you with hope and promise. We thank you for the stories which have empowered your people through the ages and given them hope. You remind us that through the teachings of Jesus, the world will be transformed anew if we do our part to love unconditionally. May we know your promise of transformation, of hope, and of your agape love among your people. May we know the promise of Jesus whose spirit invites us to become people of the way. We draw near to each other in the presence of a holy weaver, that we may see afresh, that we may hear anew, that we may act again with vigor. May there be any new patterns woven among us, patterns of peace between strangers, patterns of love between friends, patterns of hope among the hopeless, Patterns of joy among the sorrowful. We pray, O God, for those who seek to speak good news in a hostile world. We lift up those who are confronted with illness, grief, anxiety, fear, and uncertainty. Help us to be resilient and hopeful. We continue to pray for those whom aging is a trial and a burden, and for those who are lonely and those battling mental illness. Let your agape love continue to guide us as we pray for the world where violence and persecution abound. Let your voices join those who have raised their voices to stop wars in all forms and other acts of injustice, violence, and human sadness here in Canada and in many parts of the world. In light of the ongoing trackers' protest, May we echo the words of our moderator, the Right Reverend Richard Bott. Loving God, protest I understand even if I feel the reasons are sometimes misguided and wrong. Those symbols of white supremacy, representations of a desire to enslave and eradicate, those flags of hatred's, hatred's horror, They should never be flown in a way that honors them and the principles for which they stand. God, help us to put those symbols in the places that will make us remember what they represent with horror and grief and fight against them ever being raised up as possibilities for the future. God, help us to challenge the unthinking hatred, the fear and the greed that give it power the anti-Semitic hatred, the idea that white is right. God, help us, because we can't seem to do it on our own. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus, who calls us to recite this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus offered compassion for the people he met and taught us to do the same. This day, you and I are called to respond to Jesus' example to offer healing, love, and compassion as the need arises. Let us offer our gifts of time, talents, and treasures so that the ministry of this church will be a growing, vibrant witness to God's healing love. If you are not on par and wish to send in your offerings and donations, you can drop them in the mailbox by the kitchen door of the church or mail them to BCUC. You can also send in your support through e-transfer. Thank you for your continued love and support to Bell's Corners United Church. Let us pray. Gracious God, the desire of our hearts for these gifts today is that they be a source of healing, bringing together what is broken, soothing what is painful, and allowing people to move forward in the abundance of life with which you bless us. Amen. And now receive God's blessings. Our worship has ended and let us now go as God's faithful people. Go and be the compassion of God. Go and be the love of Christ. Go and be the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Go and do God's business in the world. Amen. Thank you.